chapel, the notes nor the uh, references, you know, the... The art inspired. Yeah, no, yeah, so... Yeah. So I'm not going to... It's not like... Yeah. Oh, no! Right, right, definitely. <laughs> Is it time? Well, it's time, Jane. Time? We're jumping right in That's here. okay. All right, good evening, crowd. Crowd. Thank you for, yeah, we have two people here, Jane, oh. other than you and me. Oh. No, three, excuse me, my wife. Oh, no, you wouldn't want to expect. Oh, here come more people. Good, good evening, everyone. Let's stand. We're going to open our service. If we have anybody online, uh, are we streaming now? Yes. Uh, welcome, those of you that are online. Let's stand. And uh, we are going to open in prayer. And uh, get your handbook out. We're going to be starting with Hymn 405 after our prayer. Hymn 405. Take my life and let it be. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for another day. Thank you for an opportunity to worship you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the visitors. We thank you for uh, just the, the precious blessing of being able to gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, I pray for your blessing tonight on every aspect of our service. Help us to magnify you. Help us to bring glory to you, and uh, thank you for the sweet fellowship of the saints. We commit this service to you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, turn to him 405. Take my life and let it be, and all, we'll sing all four verses. Good singing, everybody. You may be seated. And I want to welcome you to Bible Baptist Church of Upper Darby and uh, welcome you online. Just a couple of announcements. Actually, I want to share with you um, people to be praying for. Uh, thank you for praying for Mr. Kerr. He had met with a doctor, pain, pain management doctor, and uh, last I heard he's uh, anticipating or just seek, seek, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> seeking the Lord on... on um, a decision on which way to go as far as getting treatment for the pain. Uh, he's in extreme pain, especially in his back. Uh, so please pray for him. Uh, pray for Sa Sandy H Hodge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Could I get a water, somebody? I'm, my throat all of a sudden is dried up. Um, had the opportunity to talk to Sandy, and um, it's been a while since we've seen Sandy. And sadly, um, just within the, the last... Uh, well, since uh, since September of 2020 or June of 2022, <clears throat> Sandy has four adult children and she's lost two of them. Her youngest daughter just passed away this last September. And then the June prior to that, her oldest son, uh, Dick or Richard Jr., uh, passed away. And uh, she's got health issues. Uh, she is a gem, isn't she? We love Sandy. And so please be praying for her. Thank you, Gore, very much. Appreciate that. 
Uh, obviously, keep praying for Joanne. She had the opportunity to have family. All her family, almost all her family gathered around at Thanksgiving, and she's probably still recovering from that. Uh, pray for Peg Willie as well. And uh, also keep Skip and Kylie in prayer. Both of them have, I think, just passed their one-month mark of their transplants. Both of them, I believe, are doing well. Uh, the last news I've seen from both of them, talking to Skip. Uh, so pray for them uh, that they'll just completely recover. And it's a blessing talk, talking to Skip. Uh, he, uh, first of all, neither of them have to go to dialysis anymore, and they're praising the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine having to go to dialysis all the time. And I know Skip's able to drink, and his appetite is back, and he's just enjoying mm -hmm. what he has not enjoyed for a long time. Uh, so keep these folks in prayer. I want to remind you about Faith Promise. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, up until the mid-January, mid we are collecting Faith Promise cards, which are really just slips. And uh, that's only for those of you that feel that God would want you to give to our missions for next year. And it's so we can plan that out. It's totally anonymous. So please, when you fill them out, uh, just fill out what you believe God would give. Do not put your name on there. And then you put, put it in the offering plate. And only do it once. Don't fill the same one out every week. Or we will not know how much to give for missions next year. Uh, we are going to have a Christmas banquet. Banquet on uh, December 10th. Right after the morning service, it's going to be just like the, the layout of our Soup and Chili Fellowship. We're not going to break down the chairs and set up tables and all. We're just going to do what we did with the food in the back, have it light, light refreshments, light finger food after the morning service. We'll have some kind of some event thing for, for Christmas, and then we will not have the evening service. In fact, um, we're not going to have the evening service. We'll have the evening service next Sunday night. That's the first Sunday in December, Jane tells me. So we will have an evening service the next Sunday night. But then uh, throughout the rest of December, uh, we are not going to have an evening service. Uh, one will be New Year's Eve. One will be Christmas Eve. And um, uh, so just keep that in mind. And we'll announce that again. We'll put that on the website. Um, be, be praying for Josh, Josh Noble, getting married in three weeks. Just amazing. Uh, so please keep him in prayer. And... Um, also, anybody that wants offering envelopes, if you do not already get one, uh, you know, a box of them each year with your own number on it, uh, then please see me. We have plenty, and, and they're free, so be glad to give you a box for your very own. All right, let's have our offering. We'll have the men come, and uh, we're going to receive our offering from the Lord. Keep Mr. Osenbach in prayer, Dave's dad as well. He had a little spill, and um, he's doing well. I'm trying to remember Dave's last update. He's, he's uh, recovering. Uh, so just, just pray for him. He has some of needs that will go with that. Gore, would you pray for the offering, please? Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together again. We thank you for those that are here and those online. We pray for those that can't get here because of some illness or just not able to do so. We ask that you will favor them and use this offering to bless your name. Amen.
Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jane, very much. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. Please, Jeremiah chapter 6. <clears throat> and tonight we're going to look at the last four verses of chapter 6, Jeremiah chapter 6. So let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 27 through 30. God says, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. May God bless his word. Uh, please pray with me. Father, thank you so very much for your goodness to us. And uh, Father, I just ask you to bless some of the people we prayed for I pray for Mr. Kerr that you just encourage his heart and uh, give him wisdom as far as the go-ahead on this treatment and just surround him with your love and may he just sense your presence with him. I pray for Sandy, Father. Thank you for her. I pray that you'd please comfort her and draw near to her. Thank you for the support of her family, those that um, just check in on her and visit her and uh, regularly, I thank you for her children, and I pray especially for the loss of, of Dick and Cynthia and, and her husband as well. I pray that she would know and she would just be able to testify experientially that you are the God of all comfort. Pray for Joanne and Ed, and Joanne especially with her health. Just ask you to encourage her heart. And Ed, and I pray, Father, you would just please be nearer to them and assure them of your love and your presence. For Peg Willie, I pray that you'd encourage her heart, calm her, give her perfect peace. Then I lift up Kylie and skip to you and thank you for their, thank you for the miracle of answered prayer, the two donors that donated their kidneys. And I just pray, Father, that, that their recovery would just be ongoing, that their bodies, that, that these kidneys would be the kidneys that would just last them for years and years and years. Never need to, to um, have an issue with it anymore. We just commit them to you. And, and Father, we ask your blessing now on the Word. Give us a great night tonight as we head into the holiday season. Remind us of the theme of Thanksgiving. And that every holiday and every week and every month uh, would be a season of Thanksgiving for us. Uh, because that is your will for us in everything is to give you thanks and so we thank you tonight thank you for everyone that's here today thank you for those that are joining us online thank you for saving us and uh, lord we just rejoice that we can be saved and walk with you and we pray in jesus precious name amen, amen. all right let's um you may you may be seated for three minutes now let's see we are going to now turn to hymn 276 which is Jesus paid it all. I'll let you remain seated for this. Four verses. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Last verse. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks, for coming tonight. Let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 6. And uh, we are going to... Um, we're going to change gears. In our my approach to how we're going through this. We are finishing chapter 6 tonight. Six chapters. It's taken us, taken me, 41 messages to do six chapters. Mm -hmm. There are 52 chapters in Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. That means we have 46 more chapters. If we keep this pace, we're going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to preach past the rapture. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to be, uh, or at least past my passing, you know. So we are going to, starting the next, whenever the next, it probably will be next Sunday, but. Uh, from this point on, now tonight we're just going to look at the last four verses. But from now on, as we go through this book, we're just going to, each night we're just going to look at one chapter, okay? So that'll pick up the pace a little. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we'll be a little more summary, summaric, summary-like. <laughs> It'll be more, um, you know, a little less going into the specific verses like we've been doing. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure that'll be fine. We're still going to get so much from this book. So, let's uh, look at, we're at Jeremiah chapter 6, and we are continuing the theme of Jeremiah's call to, uh, in fact, in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, you'll remember that God said to Jeremiah, or to the people of Israel, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if you can find a man, and that's generic, that's man or woman is the idea there, anyone, a person, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. It very much reminds me of when uh, Abraham was pleading on behalf of the cities, the five-city region, Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was saying, if you find 50 righteous, will you not spare? It goes all the way down to 10. And here, God is saying, you search Go in the streets of Jerusalem and see if you can find anyone that, that is seeking truth. And, and I will pardon it. So it's the same tenor, the same mode. God is being provoked. God is getting ready to judge cities, or in this case, a nation, Judah. And... That gap of between you know his time when he's being provoked and they they commit the sin to when the punishment comes that time to repent is is going on and uh, he's just again telling them hey you look God is constantly looking for opportunities to show mercy and and so this picks up now we go, look at verse twenty seven we're going to see three things tonight as we break this down. Uh, verse 28, or verse 27 is, uh, Jeremiah gets a new job description. Uh, it, it's really, he's doing the same old job, but it's now a new analogy of uh, being an assayer. And we'll see that in verse 28, we see that Jeremiah gives his report. And by the way, an assayer, the word assayer is an examiner. 
And it is uh, clearly, it's not clear in verse 27, but verses 28, 29, and 30 are clearly talking about the refining process of silver, mm -hmm. the smelting. Uh, verse 27 has confused and puzzled commentators and theologians for, for a long time because of the layout of the Hebrew. And uh, we're going to look at that. But then verse 28 is the report. And then 29 through 30 is the process of how God works using the refining fire. He did it to test Job. He did it to test Abraham. He did it now. He's doing it now in, in our text to test Judah, the, the Jews, and he'll do it in our life too. We have to understand God's purpose. Now Peter will end in Peter where Peter says something about that, the idea of the fiery furnace. So it's still happening to this day to God's people. He has a purpose for the fiery trial, the testing. And so we're going to look at that. But let's jump in. Let's go right to verse 27, this new job description. Now look at the, you have a King James Version. Look at verse 27. God says to Jeremiah, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. Now that last phrase uh, fits beautifully with what's going to happen. Uh, that thou mayest know and try their way. But here's the issue that has puzzled people for, for some years. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress. Those are two unique illustrations. A tower, obviously the idea of a watchtower would not be unusual. Uh, that clearly was what Ezekiel was twice in Ezekiel 3 and 30, in chapter 33. Uh, God says, I have set you, son of man, to be a watchman. And clearly, Jeremiah would fit that description. Uh, and then the fortress is another analogy that is very common in the scriptures. But I want you to listen to, here's, here's what other versions say. In fact, uh, most, of the, most of the modern versions are consistent in, in um, here's, a, here's an example of a translation that would be very common today. And notice how different it is. Look at verse 27 in your, your Bible. Here's, here's a, an example. I have made you a tester of metals and an assayer among my people that you may know and test their way. You say, wait a minute, a tester of metals? And, and we have the word tower? And an assayer? That is, an assayer is someone that examines metals and, and so forth. And, and he has the word fortress? The translators, what's going on here? Well, let's go back to, you know, way back, to Miles Coverdale. Miles Coverdale was a student of William Tyndale, and when Tyndale was mon uh, martyred at the stake, he had not finished translating the whole Bible. And Miles Coverdale continued the work. He came out with his own, own version after Tyndale's, and his translation of this text in 1535 was this. And it's, it's like when Tala Allah was reading the um, our 1611 version of the King James, it's, it's somewhat hard to read because uh, the, the V's are used and so forth. But it's, um, here's the translation. Thee have I set for a prover of my hard people to seek out and to try their ways. Okay, now that's interesting, isn't it? And, and you know, often the King James translators would take the wording of, of Tyndale or Coverdale or some of the ones that came after that. But this, this is a different idea, isn't it? Here's the Greek version that was used uh, way before that. Here's a Greek translation of it uh, from way back. I have caused thee to be tried among tried nations, and thou shalt know me when I have tried their way. Now here is a commentator from the denomination that gave us the King James Version. Uh, in fact, this was from over 100 years ago. And um, here's what one commentator said about this verse. The verse, verse 27, is difficult as containing words in the Hebrew which are not found elsewhere and therefore have to be guessed at. The following rendering is given on the authority of the most recent commentators, he's talking over 100 years ago, and has the merit 
of being in harmony with the metallurgic imagery of the following verse. And here's his, his, um, his translation of it. As a prover of ore, I have set thee among my people, and thou shalt know and try their way. Now I want to remind you of the wise words of the King James translators themselves that came with their translation about this kind of thing. Here's a quote from the preface. It has pleased God in His divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness. That fearfulness would better beseem us than confidence. Let me read that again and, and interpret. Here's what we're getting counsel to do from the very people that translated this text. It has pleased God in His divine providence here and there to scatter words and sentences of that difficulty and doubtfulness. That would be verse 27. That fearfulness, and the, the, old, the, the idea of that word is uh, diffidence or a lack of confidence, would better beseem us than confidence. And, and they go on and encourage us in many ways, study this out. They did not believe they were the final word on every single word they translated. And yet there is this bizarre philosophy that you don't ever correct a King James translation and they told us to so let me read another comment uh, comment about that for the word trier the word tower the one that the word the Hebrew word that's translated tower Hebrew was very difficult at this time to translate back in 1600s and uh, one expositor said for a trier since the word used comes from one which signifies to try metals as gold and silver, and the rather this may be thought to be the meaning here, since the verb is made use of in this sense in the text, and the metaphor is carried on in the following words. That's the next few verses. Though the word is used for towers in Isaiah 23, 13, and may well enough be understood as a watchtower. So this is one of those difficult things. So, you know, either way, Jeremiah is being called to assess the scene, whether he's a watchman here uh, or he is a, an assayer who's going to look at this refining process. That's what this text is talking about in the next few verses very clearly. God appoints Jeremiah as an assayer of Judah. And this is very common. Imagery. Listen to Psalm 66 in verse 10. For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou, and the word is proved. Remember, prove can be to test and find out. Mm -hmm. Thou hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. So the idea of reflection Refining fire is very common in the Bible, and that's the imagery. Whether verse 27 uses the exact imagery of the assayer or is just basically generically putting him up as, okay, now it's going to be your time to examine the people, and then he goes into the uh, metallurgic illustri uh, uh, analogy. That's what he's doing here. And it's important. I, I read this recently about um, just the the refining process when it comes to diamonds. And one writer put the, said this, diamonds are formed under great pressure and heat. If these conditions did not exist, they are simply not formed. It's an important point. Let me read that again because of what's about to follow. Diamonds are formed under great pressure and heat. If these conditions do not exist, they are simply not formed. It is not that they will be low quality or smaller in size, but they will not form. God brings his refining fire into our lives to create in us what he sees fit. When he sees our lack of character, he will bring into our lives what we need. So the next time a fiery trial comes, thank God. He is producing exactly what he knows you need in your life. The only difference between a diamond and a piece of coal is pressure. I thought that was interesting. The key is that, again, um, if the conditions aren't right, it's not that you have a very low quality diamond. You don't have a diamond at all. This, this process. There must be the pressure. 
And isn't that a great illustration of what God does with us? He refines us. Don't forget that. I appreciate the words of Ron Hamilton's song, um, Rejoice in the Lord. God never moves without purpose or plan. When trying his servant and molding his man or person. You know, that's, that's what God does. He does that with us. And maybe you're going through some refining. And uh, you think it's because you've done something wrong. Listen, this is just God. God is molding a masterpiece. He's working in us. And we have to recognize that. And that's what he was doing with Judah. He was refining them in a twofold way to purge them from the dross, the impurities, but also simply to test them, to, to, to test their metal, to see what they were made of. Or to, well, he, of course, now God knows already what we're made of, but he does it uh, to demonstrate what we're made of. You know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't even know my own heart. You don't know your own heart. But you know what? God will allow us to go through pressure so that we can see our own heart based on how we respond. And it's not always flattering, is it? You know, it's not. Sometimes it's very humbling. When you're going through the fiery trial and, and you, pa you fail the test and God has shown some imperfection in your life, it is not to humiliate us. It is not because God is putting his thumb on us and saying, you are worthless. No, it's to show us so we can grow, so, so we can become conformed to the image of Christ. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Look at verse 28. Now here comes, here comes the result. They've been tested. And verse 28 says, They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders, they are brass and iron. They are all corruptible, corrupt, corruptors. It's like it, God is saying, you know what? They're the worst kind of rebel. They're full of slander. They're as hard as bronze and iron. And they lead others into corruption. They're just, they're, they're, these are bad people. How sad it is. They're the most stubborn kind of people. And, and again, we find this, this is from, Going through the refining fire. Uh, one, commenter, uh, one commentator gave the idea of what happens when in the, in the um, refining silver process. And that's what verse 29 and 30 are talking about, which we're going to go into. The ancient, let me just read it to you. The ancient metallurgical process is described in these verses, verse 29 and 30. When lead was placed in a crucible with silver ore and heated, the lead became oxidized and served as a flux to collect impurities. The bellows blew fiercely. That's going to be mentioned in the next verse or two. The bellows blew fiercely to give a high temperature. But out of the heat came only lead, copper, and iron. The ore was so impure that the whole procedure failed. The allies were not removed and the silver, if there was any, was not recovered. Application, the people of Judah were hopelessly impure metal. They were altogether slag. And beyond their refining process, it was useless to go on refining, for the wicked were not being removed. That, we just read that. So when the purification of the national character was shown to be impossible, get this, God, God's preparing, because eventually, whenever God judges People are always ready to point the finger and say, that was not fair. Mm -hmm. And God is always, you know, not only does he have that, that gap of long suffering, uh, the space to repent, not only does he give us that, but when he finally does judge us, he makes it very clear uh, that when somebody accuses God of being too harsh or not being, you know, proper in his justice, God will be able to point back and say, here's where you are wrong. And that's what he's doing through the book of Jeremiah. He is, he's preparing because he's, he, he's now getting ready to judge the people and he has certainly given them every chance to repent. And it's like he's preparing for someone to say, well, you really weren't too fair. When you, when you judge Judah, 
you really weren't too fair. And God is <laughs> clearly, he's giving his case against that. I read an awesome, awesome uh, event that happened back in the 1800s. And it was from in, in Ireland, in Dublin, Ireland, Ireland. There was a group of ladies that met, met to study the Bible together, ladies' Bible study. And uh, they were studying Malachi 3.3. 3. Malachi uh, came a little bit later on, but he used the same refining process. The verse says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. That's what God is doing in these verses. And they came to that verse in Malachi, and uh, they were puzzled by the words. And so one of the ladies said, you know, I know a silversmith, and you know what, I'm going go, to go see what, you know, there's something here. So I'm going to go and see if he'll answer some questions. I'm going to see him do his work. And, uh, and so she went. She didn't tell the silversmith anything about the verse, you know, didn't share the verse with him. Uh, you know, what they were wondering, what that meant. She just sat and observed. And um, as he was describing what he did, uh, she was kind of struck with what he did and what he didn't do. At a certain point, um, it looked like he should be more involved in, in when the fire is going. And she said, um, she said, do you sit while the work of refining is going on? And he said, oh, yes, ma'am. He said, I must sit with my eyes steadfastly fixed on the furnace. For if the time necessary for refining be exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver is sure to be injured. And it hit her like a ton of bricks. She saw the beauty and the, the, um, the comfort of the expression. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver which is kind of an interesting phrase there. Christ sees it needful to put his children, this is what she's thinking, my Savior, our God, my Savior, uh, sees it needful to put his children into the furnace, but he is seated by the side, his eye is steady, intent on the work of purifying, and his wisdom and love are both engaged in the best manner for his children. Their trials do not come at random. That's what hit her. She, as she thought about, this guy just sits and watches with steady eye the refining process. Again, because he realizes what a delicate thing is in there. And again, if he puts it in the fire a moment too long, the silver is injured. And she knew that's what our, that's what our Savior's doing. Again, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And she kind of started getting lost in the thought as she walked away. And the silversmith said, hey, wait, wait, I'm not done. Come back. And, and um, he said that the pro when the process of purifying was complete, he knew when it was done, when he could see his own reflection in the silver. And it hit her again. Isn't that what our God does? He is refining us. Why? What are, we, what are we being conformed to? The image of Jesus Christ. Remember what 1 John says when we see him? You know, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. And that, again, that's so beautiful. He says, I know when it's done, when I see my own reflection in the silver. That's our God. He allows us in love to go through the fiery furnace because he's molding us. He's refining us. He's taking out the impurities. He's testing us. But he's keeping his eyes sitting right there because he knows he will never give us more that would injure us. He knows what we need and he's waiting, looking to see his reflection in us. It's a beautiful picture. Is it not? That's what God is doing. And, and God was doing his refining process in the Jews, in the, in the people of Israel. And now we come to the examination process. Verse 29 and 30. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain. For the wicked are not plucked away. In other words, the impurities, 
the, the typical process of refining silver is to remove the the slat, the dross, the you know the imperfections. But it's not happening here. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. What an amazing thing. This is God's assessment. And remember now, we are seeing that Israel has, or Ju the Judah, the Jews, Israel, has been uh, refined. And going back to chapter 5, verse 1, go run to and fro in the streets, look for, look for anyone. And through this refining, this testing, there was no man that was seeking the Lord. Nobody. And clearly... Now, Jeremiah, uh, again, these last two verses are critical because this, this is the report. This is the, this is the, rep the process here and what, got, what the response of the silversmith. They're, uh, verse 28, they're all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed to the fire. The founder melteth in vain. He's done the process. And instead of refining and them coming forth as gold, or silver purified, they demonstrated that they were reprobate silver. Men will call them because the Lord hath rejected them. And, and you get, the, now by the way, chapters 1 through 6 are set. They're not sure when they're set, but they're definitely um, kind of summaries of what we're going to be looking at in the rest of the chapters of Jeremiah. Some people aren't exactly sure what time period, uh, but there is one time period in Judah's history that was very tumultuous, and they're thinking maybe it came from that time. But clearly this is an overview, and chapter 6 is significant because it is God's wrapping things up, and the mode now is God's saying, okay, I gave you that space to repent. I, you know, I clearly, you know, I tested you to, to demonstrate what I must do. And now I'm going to have to judge. So let's talk about God's refining process. First Peter 4, why don't you turn there, First Peter chapter 4. By the way, it's, you know, as I was studying all this, it's interesting that Jeremiah, Jeremiah was the assayer. But as we see the later part of these verses, clearly God was behind the assaying process. But Jeremiah is being called to kind of make it official. And so in other words, Jeremiah in his long ministry with the people of Judah, is in a position to be able to give his examination. That's a, By the way, an assayer, remember the, the person who's, who's, who's studying the metal and all that, and the word assayer means to examine. If you've ever, if you've ever said, we assayed the situation and came up with, that means you examined, you looked at it, you took took stock of the situation. That's what an assayer does. That's what Jeremiah was doing. He was an assayer. And interesting, there's, there was a verse that popped in my mind, kept popping in my mind as I studied this, that over the years has intrigued me because it's a, it's a verse that is referring to pastors of New Testament churches. And I, I always wondered... What exactly does this text in Hebrews mean? And then I come to this part where Jeremiah is an assayer, and it's almost like there's a parallel to the New Testament pastor. Let me read it to you. It's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. It is instruction to the people of God in the New Testament times, in the New Testament church. And in verse 17, Hebrews 13, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. So this is not government authorities. This is spiritual authorities. 
Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, that's the pastors, the spiritual leaders, the church leaders, as, here's the key, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. So the writer of Hebrews is talking to the New Testament church and talking about the, the need to, in one way or another, place themselves under the leadership of godly leaders, because they watch for your souls. That describes Jeremiah to a T. Jeremiah watched for their souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. And you would think it would say, because that would be unprofitable for them. Any pastor that has to give a, an account then does it with grief, it's not going to be profitable for him. But he's talking about the people that... Um, that the pastor cannot give a good account of. That's where it's going to be grievous. And I have found comfort in this passage because over the years, people have put themselves under my ministry and the ministry of this church and either at times, you know, just totally shown they've canceled me. That's what it is. They've canceled me. You know, they just move on and they're like, I don't care, you know, what you think and I don't care what kind of a, a, a sheep I was. You know, I'm going to go find a better church. And, and they do it in the wrong way. They do it in a way that does not honor God. And they do it in a way that makes pastoring very difficult. And I, there's been so many people that have walked out the door and I think, that's it? That, that's it? You, you, you're just going to leave like that? You're going to leave me hanging? It's like, wait a minute, you just, bye, okay, bye, you know? And, and I think, Lord, what, what's going on here? And I come and I think, Lord, is this, is this my relief that someday I'm going to be able to say, that person was not an easy person to pastor, Lord, you know? Obviously, there's not going to be any animosity or anything like that. But clearly, I, I think there might be some parallels to this a saying that Jeremiah is doing because, folks, this, if this applies to Jeremiah, and I think it does, it was grievous for Jeremiah to give the report about the, the Jews because they totally rejected his message and, and it was not profitable for them at all. Not profitable. Now look at 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. We find the New Testament application of the fiery furnace that God is still refining us uh, this is referring to those that are saved. Remember, I quoted this morning Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And then we remember Philippians, which we just looked at a few weeks ago. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. So God is working to mold us and to refine us. Now, we are ultimately, those that are saved, they're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. So when we get glorified, when we get our new bodies, when we die, we are going to be like Jesus Christ. That's going to be glorious. But right now, he is molding us to be like Christ. Look at 1 Peter 5, 5. Nope, wrong one. 1 Peter 4, 12. Which one did I tell you to go to? 4. Okay, good. I said the right one. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. What's happening to me? Had right, you ever felt like that? Things are going on, you think, what is going on? The fiery trial, we're being refined. Because we, we need to be purified. There's, there's things in our life, there's dross, this refining process. It is, yes, to test us, and it's also to remove impurities. And God says, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. God is saying, Christian, you will go through fiery trials. Don't be shocked. Don't act like I was not expecting it. And here's, now here's the thing. Look at verse 13. Here's how we're supposed to respond. But rejoice. Does it say 
be happy when things are going horrible. Just, just, I don't care how you feel, just giggle with delight when you're really broken. No, the idea is rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In other words, it goes back to Ron Hamilton's song, Rejoice in the Lord, based on Philippians 4, when he lost his eye and some of the other trials, is that sometimes, folks, you and I will go through some real fiery trials, and we may not be able to exegete our experience and say, I know what God's doing specifically, but we do know that God's refining fire is, is meant for our good. He wants to bring glory to himself. He wants to grow us, remove our impurities, and see where we are. I share the story of a, um, the wife of a Soviet dissident named Andrei Sakharov. Uh, he, was, uh, he was born in 1921, died in 1989. He was a Soviet physicist. He was a Nobel uh, Prize Peace Laureate. Uh, he was, he was uh, awarded for, he was a big human rights guy and, and um, also heavily persecuted by the Soviet Russia. And uh, his wife, uh, Elena, Alina Bonner, um, says that she wrote, or he wrote his memoirs, her husband, wrote his memoirs and she typed them, edited, and nursed the work, doing everything she could to make sure that it survived seizure by the government. Sakharov worked on his memoirs in a place called Gorky, rewriting sections because they kept vanishing. So he was writing, in a sense, to expose some of the government fraud, and apparently there would be spies and stuff, and you know he'd be laboring on this, and all you know his work would just disappear. And she said, um, one day. She met her husband at the train station. I guess he was kind of in seclusion. And with trembling lips, he told her they stole it. She says he looked like a man who had just learned of the death of a close friend. But after a few days, Sakharov returned to his work. And according to his wife, each time he rewrote his memoirs. Can you imagine pouring out your heart on paper, writing your memoirs, knowing that you've got to keep them under lock and key and it keeps disappearing and you've got to go back to the drawing board and write again and again. But here's what his wife said. Each time he rewrote his memoirs, there was something new, something better. Wow. I remember Pastor Griffith saying years ago that one time, I don't know, they had a house fire. And I, I, I'm not sure of the whole house, but his study... And all his notes, all his sermon notes, this was before computer, you know, where he could back everything up, all his notes, years and years of study in the scriptures were all burned in one day. He lost all his notes. Now, it's hard for us in this day of computers and backup, you know, things are off-site and all that, but he would go on to say that was the best thing that ever happened to him. You know, because he just kind of had to start fresh. That's the refining fire, is it not? That's the refining, the, the refining process. God is refining us. God is purging us. And what you and I have to do is submit to the process. Remember, in James, we are to let patience have her perfect work. That's not easy. That is allowing the refining fire to, Lord, whatever you want. And who, you know, who knows what God is after? He will try to teach us. He's growing us. But it is always for the better. You and I should come out of each fiery trial better than we went in. Is there room for improvement for all of us? Yes, there is. May God help us to understand the fire the, the the God's refining process refining fire and let's let's submit to it say lord whatever you have teach me mold me have me let's pray father thank you for your word thank you for this encouragement we get from Jeremiah chapter 6 
as we learn of Jeremiah as an assayer, really you as an assayer, as the silver going through the smelting process and being refined and going through the fire, Father, help us to realize that, um, that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that, that you, are, you are working on us and that you never move without purpose or plan when you try us, when you test us, when you mold a person for Jesus Christ. And we ask your blessing. Help us, Lord, to submit to what you're doing. Help us not to fight it. Help us not to be like Saul that was fighting against the goads as you were attempting to convict him and get, get hold of him. I pray, Father, that we would not fight you, but that we would submit and that we would grow. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books, and we are going to turn to hymn 248. That sound right, Jane? Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's all stand. Oh, how I love Jesus. We'll sing all three verses before we are dismissed. Hymn 248. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me on the last. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great Thanksgiving week. Continue the Thanksgiving. <laughs>